Uh, first, the Social Club is going to have a bake sale in front of Stevenson. Um, this Thursday, Tim, or next Thursday? This Thursday, 9.30 to 12.30. They'd like you to come and buy something, and the proceeds are going to go to the Rwandan Orphanage Fund. Oh. So you can have something sweet and do something sweet at the same time. Oh. I know, I have the gift of gas. <laughs> Some of you receive, oh, uh, you're getting flyers handed around about fundraising. Um, Land of Theta New is uh, attempting to raise funds for a scholarship. Uh, they'd like you to come to Cold Stone Creamery on Thursday. Thursday will be your day to indulge in sugar. In any case, um, the Cold Stone Creamery is... Ooh, Cold Stone Creamery and we'll give a portion of each ice cream to their scholarship fund. So they want you to indulge yourself for a great cause. Now here's another significant cause. With your uh, attendance sheet, you received uh, a letter asking the, the uh, asking the state legislature to reject the governor's proposed budget. And the reason for that is that um, significant cuts to higher education. How many of you graduate? Okay. This is important to you, and I'll tell you why. Because I know that many of you might choose someday to have children. And if you want there to be a UC and a CSU system that's anywhere where it is now, and we are slipping, and you need to request that the budget not uh, go for the jugular at uh, the institutions of higher learning. So it's entirely voluntary, but we would like you to sign this, and Tara will collect them with uh, your attendance sheets, and we'll send them all in together. And I want to thank Ilka for being the person who spearheaded making sure that we got those, and to Tara for once again going in. Xeroxing for me. Please uh, put your address and especially clear your zip code. Sign it and then print your signature also. But it is voluntary. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and now it's my great pleasure to introduce our lecturer for today, who is, of course, one of our own. Barbara Lesh McCaffrey received her bachelor's degree from Brooklyn College of the City University of New York, cum laude, in English. Uh, she has a master's degree in English from the University of Maryland, and her PhD from the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee. Madison. <laughs> I'm thinking of next week's speaker, <laughs> who teaches at Madison. Her dissertation was Basil Bunting, a major British modernist. And her area of concentration was 20th century British and America, American literature. Barbara is our uh, interdisciplinary faculty member. She teaches um, in AMCS, American Multicultural Studies. She teaches in the Hutchins School. She is also associated with two programs in the School of Social Sciences, and that is our very own sociology course, Holocaust Lecture Series, and also Women in Gender Studies. She's currently the president of the Alliance for the Study of the Holocaust at Sonoma State, which is the fundraising organization that makes sure that we can bring speakers and pay their honoraria and pay for your Xeroxing and several other activities that we do on campus. Barbara took over this year and has done a wonderful job in encouraging people in the community to get more involved. Her academic interests are in the fields of women's 
into literature, especially writers and poets from underrepresented backgrounds in the United States based on race, religion, economic status, or sexual orientation, as well as the works of women from developing countries. More recently, her scholarly attention has been focused on women's studies from a global perspective, Holocaust literature, and the literature of the Middle East. Um, it is my great um, collegial honor to present Barbara to you, who will be speaking on post-Holocaust lit literature, uh, giving voice to silence. So I want to welcome our own Barbara. Well, thanks a lot for the wonderful reception, and we get to use this wonderful microphone, which makes such interesting noises. I know about you, but I had a lot of fun putting this together. And I found out that uh, I probably put about 10 or 15 days into the reading and the preparation, and then I had a lot of fun playing with images. I hope you will enjoy the presentation. It is a whirlwind. We're going to cover lots of different things. And my aim is to give you a flavor of this. You will find all of the slides with text are available on e-reserves. So you can pull them out and read them on your own. And there are also two short stories that we have excerpts on, uh, The Shawl and Hayuda's Engagement Party, both of which are on, on e-reserves. And at least those people in my section, please make sure you read them for Thursday because we're going to talk about them. In preparing for this talk, what I looked at is some of the most recent scholarship that's coming out. Um, I went to the Sonoma State Library. It's a place where many of you are unlikely to start your research. Um, I found over 100 books just on the topic Holocaust literature and probably another 50 on Holocaust poetry. It was pretty overwhelming. What I did was focus on some of the critics who at least in my discipline, are the most highly regarded. And to really look at the most recent work, so as to give you a flavor of where this discipline is going, because it has evolved considerably. Initially, what we had were diaries and letters of people who either survived the Holocaust or didn't. We then had memoirs and autobiographies and literary works from people who were survivors. We had works from people who managed to get out. We had works from people who were not in the camps, who were hidden, or who survived by their own wits. Um, much later, we started getting the literature of those people who had been born while the Holocaust was ongoing or before it and who were influenced by it in their personal lives, most of them Jewish. And from there, we ended up getting the people who were the second generation, who are the children of survivors. And what we've seen now is this enormous spread into the whole of our liter literary imagination, especially in this country, in Germany, in France, in Italy, where the Holocaust becomes a theme. And my goal today is to start out with the writers who actually were affected by the Holocaust and hopefully by the time we end, move us to the point where we have a glimpse of some of the writing coming out of the genocides that we've been studying in this course. So here goes for a wonderful journey, I hope. In a book that just came out a couple of months ago, uh, in an article by uh, very recognized scholar Alvin Rosenfeld, he talks about the fact that there is, a, is there such a thing as Holocaust literature and what is it? For if, if by Holocaust literature all we have in mind is a large but loosely arranged collection of novels, poems, essays and plays about a subject, even one so enormous and unnerving as the Nazi genocide, then our concerns while interesting and legitimate are not really compelling. He goes on to say that by contrast, Holocaust literature occupies another sphere of study, 
one that is not only topical in interest, but it extends so far as to force us to contemplate what may be fundamental changes in our modes of perception and expression, our altered way of being in the world. And I think that we'll see with the literature that we're going to be looking at, really that emphasis not just on recollecting the events, but looking at how it shapes our moral imagination, how it influences our action, things that I think we've been looking at all semester. Another very well-respected scholar, Susan Gubar, who's probably one of the leading feminist scholars in literature and in particularly in poetry, has a recent study called Poetry After Auschwitz, Remembering What One Never Knew. And she talks about the injunction by a thinker by the name of Adorno that after the Holocaust and after Auschwitz, poetry, and I think by implication writing, is blasphemous. And she retorts that indeed it isn't blasphemy. We need to be looking at it. She says, if the only reports of those who personally witness the destruction of the Jewish people can be judged meaningful, if efforts to make the event consequential by and for those born after it are deemed a profanation, a blasphemy of the dead or an exoneration of their murders, then the Holocaust is doomed to expire. And she enjoins us not to let it expire. She says, despite the difficulties, knowing how to speak of the dead, how to speak to the dead, and how to speak for the dead, what the dying of the last Holocaust survivors at the turn of the century teaches us is the necessity of keeping the Holocaust alive, now through the exertion of those who never struggled with its ghastly regimes. In other words, the importance of people of our generations, mine, yours, Evie's, um, engaging in this analysis, engaging in the creation of literature. As Walter Benjamin says, every image of the past that is not recognized by the present as one of its own concerns, one of its own concerns, threatens to disappear irretrievably. So if we don't make it our own, if we don't make it real in our own lives, then all that has happened can't be retrieved. We don't understand it. So let's see what these poets have to tell us, what these writers have to tell us. The first person I've chosen is Eddie Hilsom. Um, she was born in the Netherlands. Her history in some ways parallels Anne Frank, that figure for most of us that was the start of our understanding of the Holocaust. She was also in the transit camp at West Fork. And as the dates indicate, she did not survive that experience. But she wrote eloquently, and we have both diaries and letters that she gave to friends who are non-Jews before she was taken into the, the uh, transit camps. And those have finally gotten into print. They were some of the earliest stuff that I actually saw. Uh, she was born in 1914. Um, and her parents had fled pogroms in Russia, which is how they ended up there. Hilsom's diaries describe the isolation and segregation of Dutch Jews. And we should note that 82% of the Dutch Jewish people, um, of the 82% of the Dutch Jewish people who ended up in the camps, less than 5% survived, which is a staggering number. And the piece that we'll be looking at is really her understanding of mortality and her coming to terms with the fact that she was probably not going to survive this experience. Very well then, this new certainty that what they are after is our total destruction. I accept it, I know it now, and I shall not burden the others with my, faces, my fears. I work 
and continue to live with the same conviction, and I find life meaningful. My life has, so to speak, been extended by death. Go on. It sounds paradoxical. By excluding death from our life, we cannot live a full life, and by admitting death into our life, we enlarge and enrich us. Enrich it. And here are some images of Westerbork. The next person that I would like to talk to a little about, and only a little about, is Elie Wiesel. He is probably one of the best known writers and probably one of the most prolific. He's a survivor of both Auschwitz and Buchenwald and was 16 when the war ended. And so many of the people who we have met in our course who are survivors and so many of these writers were children or young teens during the Holocaust. We're not getting as much currently of people who were older. The majority of those people did not survive. The majority of the people who survived were somewhere in the ages of 15 into the 30s. So that we lost the youngest part of the generation and the oldest. Um, he's from an area in Romania. And when he was 15, he and his family were deported to Auschwitz. At the end of the war, Wiesel and a group of orphan children from concentration camps were taken to France. And his memoir was first published in 1956 in Yiddish, um, and then later translated into French. And this is a small segment from a book many of you have read, Night. And it talks about the fact that he understands his father's death. I'll give you a second to look at it, read it. And then he goes on to say, there were no prayers at his grave, no candles were lit in his memory, to his memory. His last word was my name, a summons to which I did not respond. I did not weep and it pained me that I could not weep. But I had no more tears, and in the depths of my being, in the recesses of my weakened conscience, could I have searched it. I might perhaps have found something like, free at last. Primo Levi is another survivor who was quite young when he was in Auschwitz. And this is the poem which is the epigraph to survival in Auschwitz. You who live safe in your warm houses, you who find returning in the evening hot food and friendly faces, consider if this is a man who works in the mud, who does not know peace who fights for a scrap of bread, who dies because of a yes or no. Consider if this is a woman without hair and without name, with no more strength to remember, her eyes empty and her womb cold like a frog in the winter. Meditate that this came about. I commend these words to you. Carve them in your hearts at home and in the street, going to bed, rising, repeat them to your children, or may, you, or may your house fall apart, may illness impede you, may your children turn their faces from you. So the injunction to remember, or our theme this semester, what does never again mean? And the verses here are very much influenced by a Hebrew Prayer to teach your children to remember the rules 
and the laws of God to respect them. So he is adapting this on a form that many Jewish writers would be familiar with and many Jewish people would be familiar with. And I think we've all seen this image of Auschwitz before, particularly in the video that we saw that Bernard had done. The next writer is Paul Ceylon. I think if we were to look at the three most important writers right after the Holocaust, it would probably be Primo Levi, Elie Wiesel, and Paul Ceylon. They're, they're kind of the pantheon of the best known. And I, I felt I needed to include them, but I wanted to include other voices that maybe don't get as much attention. Um, Ceylon is considered perhaps the most, Germ uh, most important German-speaking poet since 45. Um, in 1918, the area he lived in became part of Romania. Um, it was occupied by the Soviets in June of 1940. And when Romanian troops reconquered the area, they killed the majority of the Jews who were living there. Um, he recognized that his life was in danger and he went into hiding. But he couldn't per, um, persuade his parents to do it as well. And they did not survive the camps. Uh, he ended up in a forced labor camp in Romania. And we're going to do a little switching. There you go. And put it back. Go ahead. And then put it back on slideshow. Up to slideshow on the top. Gedichte und Prosa von Paul Celan, gelesen vom Autor. This is him reading the poem that we're going to see in a second in, Ge in German. Schlachte Milch der Frühe, wir trinken sie abends, wir trinken sie mittags und morgens, wir trinken sie nachts, wir trinken und trinken. Wir schaufeln ein Grab in den Lüften, da liegt man nicht denk. Ein Mann wohnt im Haus, der spielt mit den Schlangen, der schreibt, der schreibt, wenn es dunkelt nach Deutschland, dein goldenes Haar, Margarete. Er schreibt es und tritt vor das Haus und es blitzen die Sterne, er pfeift seine Rüden herbei, er pfeift seine Juden hervor, lässt schaufeln ein Grab in der Erde, er befiehlt uns, spielt auf nun zum Tanz. Schwarze Milch der Frühe, wir trinken dich nachts, wir trinken dich morgens und mittags, wir trinken dich abends, wir trinken und trinken. Ein Mann wohnt im Haus, der spielt mit den Schlangen, der schreibt, der schreibt, wenn es dunkelt nach Deutschland, dein goldenes Haar, Margarete, dein aschenes Haar, Sulamit. Wir schaufeln ein Grab in den Lüften, da liegt man nicht eng. Er ruft, stecht tiefer ins Erdreich, ihr einen, ihr anderen spielt weiter zum Tanz auf. Er greift nach dem Eisen im Gurt, er schwingt, seine Augen sind blau. Stecht tiefer die Spaten, ihr einen, ihr anderen spielt weiter zum Tanz auf. Schwarze Milch der Frühe, wir trinken dich nachts, wir trinken dich mittags und morgens, wir trinken dich abends, wir trinken und trinken. Ein Mann wohnt im Haus, dein goldenes Haar, Margarete, dein aschenes Haar, Sulamit, er spielt mit den Schlangen. Er ruft, spielt süßer den Tod, der Tod ist ein Meister aus Deutschland. Er ruft, streicht dunkler die Geigen, dann steigt ihr als Rauch in die Luft. Dann habt ihr ein Grab in den Wolken, da liegt man nicht eng. Schwarze Milch der Frühe, wir trinken dich nachts, wir trinken dich mittags. Der Tod ist ein Meister aus Deutschland. Wir trinken dich abends und morgens, wir trinken und trinken. Der Tod ist ein Meister aus Deutschland, sein Auge ist blau. Er trifft dich mit bleierner Kugel, er trifft dich genau. 
Ein Mann wohnt im Haus, dein goldenes Haar, Margarete. Er hitzt seine Rüden auf uns, er schenkt uns ein Grab in der Luft. Er spielt mit den Schlangen und träumet. Der Tod ist ein Meister aus Deutschland. Dein goldenes Haar, Margarete. Dein aschenes Haar, Sulamit. For so many people, this is one of the most powerful poems written about the Holocaust, where the black milk is a transformation of what we would conceive of as the nourishment one gets from a mother. Here, it's the evil. It's the sense of losing a sense of self and of being buried under the darkness. Paul Ceylon, like very many writers who survived the Holocaust, ended up committing suicide. And there have been a lot of studies of why people who managed to survive chose later to end their lives. And that sense of a huge amount of guilt. Why did he survive and not his parents? Is a very much a part of his writing. The next writer, I think, has a, a slightly different tack. How many of you have seen Schindler's List? Do you remember the scene with the girl in the red coat? It turns out Roma Lagoka is that girl. Um, it was a coat that her grandmother made her that was strawberry red. And as a result, um, she was able, with her mother, to escape the Warsaw Ghetto, where she was as a very small child, starting at age two. And a Polish family took them in and hid them throughout the war. She's written an amazing biography called, not surprisingly, A Girl in a Red Coat. And in the biography, she talks about the fact that she was told by friends to go see Schindler's List. And it wasn't until she actually saw the film that she realized that that figure in the film was based on her life. Um, she's also quite a gifted artist, and we'll see a little bit of her artwork. But I thought it was eloquent as she talks about what, what it's like as a kid um, with the adults who had survived the camps. And a lot of the early thinking about the Holocaust was that the children who were very small would have no memory. And what she and many of the other writers talk about is the fact that they have very clear memory, very poignant and very powerful memories. I can still hear the stories the grown-ups told. I won't ever be able to forget them. It didn't help putting my hands over my ears, creeping under the bed, or pulling the blanket over my head. There was no escape for us children. They had no pity on us. We were turned into involuntary witnesses by those who were bearing witness. An interesting, involuntary witnesses by those bearing witness. As soon as it got dark outside, the grown-ups would begin to talk about all they had lived through, about death, about unimaginable atrocities, about tortures, the agonies human beings are capable of inflicting on fellow human beings, and that their victims are able to endure. This was the time for lamentation and for grief, the time for anger and bitterness. After that, the voices of the survivors fell silent, many of them for all time. And our generation, the generation of their children, we too no longer spoke of it. And later on, we'll be looking at this cost of silence 
for survivors. And here are some of her paintings. She actually had quite a career as a um, set designer and costume designer. And there's a haunted quality, reminds many of us of Edvard Munch, that very long face. Um, and I found actually a whole website of them. These are only a, a few. Um, how she's transformed that sense. And in all of these, even if the mother is not able to protect the child, the mother is connected to the child. And that's very much her experience of the Holocaust. And I think a lot of the critics say that there isn't one story of the Holocaust. There are individual stories of each person in the Holocaust. And so we could spend weeks doing this. You probably wouldn't appreciate that, right? Or maybe so. Does this guy look familiar? Have you met him somewhere? This is the book he didn't talk about. It's called False Papers, Deception and Survival in the Holocaust. Basically, his parents brashly took on the position that they were Polish nobility. And they managed to survive by being obnoxious to anybody who doubted them. It was amazing. But it turns out the qualities that had his parents survive in Nazi Germany did not support them in their lives after the Holocaust. In other words, their ability to be successful during the Holocaust was just the opposite of their experience afterward. And he talks about the fact that he really didn't know he was Jewish at all until after his family was out and safely in Belgium. It was nearly comical if the implications had not been so dreadful that the very false papers, the phony birth certificates, and the Ken Carton that had saved our lives during the Nazi occupation now threatened us with deportation once we fell under Soviet rule after the liberation. My parents thought of burning them but they were the only identification we had. So we soldiered on, me obliviously, as Zamjowskis. I hope I'm not doing injustice to the Polish. His father says to him, there is something you must know. During the war, yes, well during the war, and here my father began to grin broadly and my mother suppressed a nervous giggle, well during the war people do some strange things, right? Sure. I try to go along with what seemed to be a joke or at least a funny story. Oh, what the hell, said my father as he pushed off the windowsill and sat himself at my mother's feet on their bed. You're a Jew. What? So I'm Jewish, I thought, without knowing what that meant, except hadn't we killed Jesus? Thanks. I looked up at the faces of my parents and realized that their smiles were those of chagrin, not of pleasure. It was almost as if the revelation of our true identity, which they had tried to pass off lightly, as almost a prank, had not been convincing. It was, it was a joke. It was a joke that had gone too far, and they seemed embarrassed by the result. As for me, the unintended but for their prank, I felt confused but also to some extent relieved at finally being included in the secret lore of my parents' lives. So many things suddenly became clear and for that inclusion I was willing, for the moment at least, to trade Christian for Jew, Zamjowski for Mendelssohn, which his father changed to Melson. So his family escaped having this on there clothing. The next writer is Irena Klepfish. Um, I discovered her work very early on. She uh, edited a special edition of a scholarly magazine 
devoted to Jewish women's writing. And it was the first time that I ever saw anything in Ladino. I'd never even heard of Ladino, which is the Spanish influenced language spoken by Jews primarily expelled from Spain and dispersed all over the world, many in the Netherlands and in Central and South America. And so I discovered her also because of her work trying to keep alive her mother language, which was Yiddish. She was born in Wausau in 1941. She spoke Polish as a small child. In Sweden for three years after the war, she learned Swedish. At the age of eight, she moved to New York and learned American English and went to an after school program where she also learned Yiddish. So for her, the issue of language is very, very important. Um, she's a Holocaust survivor and the daughter of a Holocaust survivor and really looks to her mother as the person who helped them survive. And the question of what it took for her mother to help them survive and, and what the cost was. So I'm not going to read all of it, but give you a little bit of this poem called A Visit. The woman who is coming to visit is my mother. Her life has been bracketed by historical events over which she's had no control. During World War II, she developed a canniness for detecting Jews. I saw this as an interesting parallel with Nelson's ability to hide. Did not care how many documents they had to prove they had to prove who they were. She knew. She could tell by a special look in their eyes, a gesture of the hand, a confidence, too casual. This acquired ability, so finely tuned during the war years, remains alive. So that today, decades later, she cannot wander far from her Jewish neighborhood before she begins assessing who are the safe ones and who are not. She goes on to say her survival was dependent on her mother's ability to pass and her schooling, that she learned Polish and didn't speak it with a Yiddish accent, which would have marked her. When the Germans came for her, she begged, Ich habe ein kleines Kind. I have a sick child. And when she saw the sliver of hesitation in their eyes, she ran. She took her chances. They did not chase or shoot, just let her go. For months, she convinced the peasants she was a Pole, playing a part, ad living the dialogue without a flaw, pretending to be the human being they assumed she was. Remember the propaganda that we saw early on that Michael Thaler talked about, where Jews were perceived as less than human. During this time, she learned survival depends on complete distrust. Even today, she is still fierce in her refusal to rely on others. Some would call it alienation, others pride. I think it's only the necessary stance of any survivor. She says history has a way of repeating itself. And at the end of the poem talks about the fact that there are no walls or barbed wire around her this time, no plans for uprisings or secret meetings. Her father died in the Warsaw ghetto uprising. He was one of the leaders. Each evening she returns, hurrying through the orderly streets, ominous in their emptiness, and steps into the elevator. I want to offer her advice, strategy, a philosophy, but know their utter uselessness in this age, for now is a vastly